your guides to a really great financial future. Tom and Don are talking real money. Hello, everyone. It's that time again. Yeah, I know. It doesn't feel like two weeks, but it's time for Talking Real Money, Sound Investing, the podcast, and, oh, yeah, the video cast. There is nothing like it on the internet today. And, you know, it's for good reasons, several good good reasons. Hello, I'm Don McDonald, one of the hosts of Talking Real Money, joined by the other host of Talking Real Money, Tom Cock, over there. And, of course, we, sh- we we will never forget the inimitable, the one, the only, Mr. Paul Merriman. And only slightly overweight. Only. Slightly. We're interrupting his walk, slightly. so we need to pick this up a little yeah. bit. He's going for a walk here soon. So yeah. let's go. Okay. Go ahead. Take your thing. It's portable, isn't it? Just go on your, we'll do a video. It'll be more fun. You guys may remember this, but we had a guy send in a video uh, listening to one of our shows, podcast. He was walking through the jungle of South America. I don't remember. While, oh, it was wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. While the anaconda from Smith Barney came after him and the whatever. Yeah, I got it. Got it. I got it. Rough place. Rough place. Anyway, the old there, days. I just did a jungle for y'all. Hey, um, we're today we're going to talk about something really interesting, and that is time. Um, when you go online, you'll see a lot of money managers and mutual funds and the like say, we had the best one-year track record of anybody over the past, well, year, or over three years, over five years. But what is a good track record? What is a good time frame? We, it's hard to put all of this into perspective. How long should you hold an investment? How long a track record should an investment have? There's a lot of confusion about this. Some people will say two years, three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years. I've heard 30 and 40 years you gotta you got to measure. So let's talk about that because uh, recently, uh, Craig Israelson, is that correct, Paul? Right. Talked about what's the right time, the amount of time to be invested. What is the right amount of time, Paul? You know, this is an amazing article, and I I hope that uh, all of our listeners and viewers will take the time to read it. We'll both have links to it, I'm sure. But he focuses on what I have found is one of the most difficult things to deal with with investors, because the industry talks, for example, and the three of us do, I know. If you go back to 1928, the uh, return is nine or 10 or 11 percent, whatever it might be. And this message is then recorded by the investor and they think that is what I will get. I'm not going to be in a hurry. I'm not going to care about one year, but by golly, by the time I've been holding that for five or 10 years, I certainly should be getting that return. And the point that Craig Israelson Israelson makes is it ain't that predictable. And the numbers, the numbers tell the story and you guys have got them. And I think it's a story that a lot of investors may not be willing to accept. Well, but to that, there there are very famous people out there spouting a lot of numbers. And one of those who gets quoted probably more than anyone in, in the financial industry, if you can call what he does financial industry, is Dave Ramsey. Yeah. And Dave is always saying, every time he talks about investing on his show, you can expect a 12% per year return on your investment. You missed one word. You missed one word he uses. It keeps him out of jail. He says an average return. I mean, that's the starting point that is so misleading because he's using the average return over the last 90 years when it's the compound rate of return that Craig Israelson looks at and that we look at. But explain that. What is it we should be looking at? And as investors, what is it we should be expecting? Well, if if we're going to grow wealth, we're going to grow wealth based on a compounding rate of return. Just a quick example. You put money into something and it goes up 50%. $100 is worth $150. 
it goes down the next year 50%. Now, he would say the average return was zero. Up 50, down 50. That's not the way it works. Because your 100 goes to 150, and then down 50 puts you back at 75. It's actually about a 13% negative compound rate of return. So that is really misleading. What Craig, though, is, is focused on is what I think we're all hoping for our clients. If they could just get the compound rate of return for, and he goes back uh, 95 years, I think, uh, if he could do that, that that would be a really great return, at least historically. But the question that he answers historically is how often does that return really happen on a shorter term basis? And by the way, his, his hurdle in terms of getting the return is 35 years. You've got to hold something 35 years to have a high probability of getting this long-term return. Well, that's the number I want to talk about. What? So 35 years is the time frame you need to be ready to accept to get what kind of return? Well, in the case of the S&P 500, it's a little over 10%. In the case of the small cap index, which he also covers, it's a little over 11%. And then he asks the question, if you go out 35 years, what is the probability that you are going to get that 10 or that 11%? Because that's what you're, that's what you're trying to buy. Well, the probability is around 80%, which means you don't get it even going out 35 years all the time. But the shocker, I think, for people is that if you look at five years worth of performance, you've got about a 50-50 chance of getting that return. And, and here's the killer, the average underperformance when you don't get that return is about 4.5% a year. And for many people, that's going to be their first exposure to the return that they're looking forward to so they can retire early. But you got to get out there many years before you're likely to get that return. Doesn't mean you can't get lucky. You can. Then, Tom, how do we put this to practice? Well, use? let's step back. When we're building portfolios. Yeah, for let's people. step back. First of all, uh, just for people that are tuning in and don't really know the portfolio, Craig's talking about a diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds, right? I mean, this is what we believe and what he's writing about, right? He's looking at these asset classes and saying, can you sort of believe that you will get this in a certain period of time, right? I mean, I think that's what he's really trying to. And by the way, I think I have this right, Paul. I mean, he even finds. You mentioned the four and a half percent, but over the longer haul where the, you haven't gotten the performance, the differences have been pretty small in terms of what the that performance has been over the long haul. So when, about a half a percent, yeah, about a yeah. half a so percent, it's, that would not four and a half, yeah, but a half pretty small. So, I mean, again, th for me as a, a financial advisor, asset manager, I'm going to tell people <laughs> that uh, we all want normal, but there ain't no normal. Right. I mean, I, I still and Don's going to hate me for saying this, but. You know, in one of my favorite movies, Tombstone, I think it's Doc Holliday that says, "You're going to quote another old Doc movie." Doc Holliday says to Wyatt Earp, oh. or no, Wyatt Earp says to Doc Holliday, "All I want, Doc, is a normal life." And Doc Holliday says, "There ain't no normal life. There's just life." And I think that's true in so many ways. We all want, you know, I just want to get on this path. I'm going to stay on this. Going to work. We don't know what path is going to work in the future with retirement. We do know in the long run. By the way, if the long run is the three of us will no longer be here. and We won't worry about money anymore. That will not be the number one concern. But to your question, Don, about building a portfolio, I think, honestly, the return's great. If we can make that money for people, terrific. But the first decision always has to be about what you, the investor, ends up believing. Do you believe in being diversified? Do you believe in having low cost? Do you believe in that truly some of these asset classes that most people simply don't access will make a difference over time. 
once you believe that, whatever comes, you're right, Paul, in the next five years or 10 years, and we've all known that we had a, a, a long period where small and small value didn't perform the way we think it should because of the way it has performed over the last 90 years, et cetera. You just deal with it then. You just say, well, I'd still believe this and it should work out over time. But the reality is we don't we don't know that any better than anyone else, whether it's Jim Cramer or anyone else you want to pick on in the financial media about what the future might look like. But we put the odds in our favor by being diversified and by keeping your costs low. Otherwise, the, the, the future is completely uncertain for me. You know, I think I'd like your old movie quotes better if you did them in character. Okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> You know, you should have done that in character with a little bit of a, you know, Western. You could do it. No normal. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I could add. What's the, I, I could add something. Yes, Paul. There because Don, you're going to add an old movie quote? Please. I've got, of course, I've got an old movie. Oh, what dump? Have we, no. <laughs> um, you uh, asked what return I was, that he had studied. I gave you the return of individual equity asset classes. To be fair. The 60 40, 60 equity, 40 fixed income that he did this long study on, that return was about 9%. And, uh, and so it was a lower rate of return and lower risk. Let me, now that you've stated that balanced return, which is the number a lot of people end up getting caught up with uh, and, and, and stuck in their heads, that 9% return. With 40% of that long-term portfolio in bonds during a very unique period in interest rate history where literally for the entire period, interest rates gradually fell, is there any chance of expecting anything like that over the next 35 years? It's possible over the next 35, Don. I do believe that. But that means first, it probably has to go the other way, go up for a while, then to come back down. I mean, that's not so different from the stock market in that in that way. It can underperform for a decade and still turn right around and, and, and come up and make money. So those are things we don't know. I do know this. Every time I see a study like this, I say, hey, where's the small cap? Hey, why do you have 10% in cash in that portfolio? Where's the large cap value? <laughs> you start criticizing the way he put the portfolio together. But the real, the real important end result in terms of building knowledge is understanding how poor that early period could be. But I want to tell you, there is a big silver lining because for first time investors, young people, that's okay. If you get poor returns in those early years while you're trying to buy and build a portfolio of equities for the future, you're buying them cheap. That actually is what you want. It's only your parents and your grandparents that are looking for something that's going up all the time. We know that, but it's often, in fact, almost always really difficult to maintain that perspective when all around you are screaming, I just made a fortune in Bitcoin or GameStop or AMC, you shouldn't be losing at all. It then becomes the FOMO, YOLO, oh no. I mean, you asked about the practical application of all of this. And yeah, and that's really well, what it some of this down to. we've shared. I mean, the software that we use to show people how likely they are to still have enough money to sustain their, their lifestyle for a long period of time. It looks at returns that are dramatically their projections. Returns will be much less in the future, right? They don't. I don't think they really know any more than we do, but they they knock returns down by quite a bit. What, what, what do I think you should do? I think you should, if you're retiring today, Paul. You make a great point about young people, but for most of the work that we do is for people that are getting close to retirement. You probably need to have lower expectations of returns for the aforementioned bond part. If you're going to own bonds. The likelihood is, you know, you're right. We'd have to have a, a rapid run up and then, and then again, a slow uh, downturn. That would be a difficult scenario. I think number two is for most people, they need to probably take less risk because they have, they have a sense, people have a sense of, I want some of that. But then in retirement, really generally, it's more about keeping the money. And that brings me to the other part. 
that you mentioned, Doc, that I think is critical for anyone who's investing, investing, and we know Jason Zweig picked on his employer, the Wall Street Journal last week for calling speculators investors, and he's absolutely right. If Which they're still, they're still doing. doing. If you're looking at this every day, if you're paying attention to what's new, the new shiny object, if you're, I, I need to have some of that SPAC or I need to be whatever, that's the worst thing you can do. We know this, the chasing the hot returns is the, you need to figure out the track you're on and tune everything else out. We know those people, those investors, you investors, do far better over the long haul with that approach rather than moving around. Then, Paul, isn't it foolish to have any kind of a number, an expectation in your head? No, I think you need, as a part of a plan, what you're shooting for, because that is going to drive how much you invest, how much risk that you're willing to take. But as Tom says, it probably is smart to use a lower compound rate of return because you guys are money managers. I am but a teacher. And here's what I'd like to know from money managers. When I look at these numbers and it says that if I use this four asset class strategy, and I would want to get this 9% return in order to get where I'm trying to go. What do you do when the chart shows that you're only going to make that amount of money 82% of the time? What do you do? And, and wait, you would have, you would only have had made that money 82% of the time. There is, that is not going to necessarily carry forward into the future, which is why I was asking the question about expectations and return expectations. Aren't we putting the cart before the horse when we're talking about what you sh- what you expect? Shouldn't we start with what you can stand? If How we much can risk figure, you can take? If we can figure it out. It is one of the most difficult uh, jobs that you guys do is sitting with somebody and helping them determine that amount when normally they don't have much experience really with investing. As a matter of fact, they may have had some tough times in the past, but they want to forget those tough times. They don't want to remember the lessons they learned because they're uncomfortable. So there is almost nothing more difficult than to work with somebody to figure out what is their risk tolerance going to be because everybody in the industry believes almost any decent long-term strategy will work if you give it time. Well, and to that end, I mean, we haven't had really, we had a very brief downturn last spring that was sharp, but brief. But really, we've had a 12-year bull market. So people, it's easy to forget the tough times because that was a long time ago. And then especially if you're 30, you weren't an investor then. I mean, this is something that happened in another another age. And as you know, Paul, we have a, a risk quiz that we offer free at our website. Mm-hmm. And if you really want to know, we have the electrode version where we hook you up and we turn up the power. on. No, we don't do that. But <laughs> you don't know. People don't know what their risk is until it happens. Because until this market goes down by 30%, then you find out. I mean, I had, this is a true story. Grown men calling me crying last spring because they'd lost so much money in such a short period of time. And this was a unique experience. We've never had a pandemic. This is never coming back. The world's completely changed. And yet look where we are, you know, 15 months later. It feels like things are pretty opened up here again. So until you really get to that point, you can say, oh, I'll put circle the 12% a year return. I'm happy to see the volatility. No problem. Until your $1 million is half a million a year from now, and you realize that's a lot of pain for people to take. So I don't think people really do know their risk tolerance. And again, I will still go back to the return part of this. You're right. People want a number, Paul. They want to say, okay, if I make 7% a year, I'll be okay. I, I, I make no sort of claim like that when I meet with people. I just say it's you should decide on the style. What do you believe? And what don't you believe? That's Republican or Democrat for me, for most people. Once you've decided on that, then you invest with that in mind. And you have there's a level of hope. There's a level of optimism, right? Because investing is about optimism, that that things will grow. Companies will do well. The economy will grow. All those things. 
if that doesn't come to pass, well, then that that just didn't come to pass in your lifetime. Basically, life's an exercise in optimism. Indeed. Or Pretty if we want to use, of it. use the word faith. I mean, at, at the end of the day, you're trusting something, uh, and and there is there there is no higher power in the stock market or the bond market, and so that faith can be easily uh, misplaced. I think, which is why we want people to save more. I just talked to a young fellow yesterday in his thirties, saving seventy percent of his income because he wants to retire early. Now he may fail, but boy, is he taking care of the part that he can control. Now he has to just cross his fingers and hope that the early years of this process will be good for him. So is he living in a van a la nomad land or something? No, he's got a very good job. I guess so. Seventy percent. Very good job. I mean, I hope he's still buying himself a cup of coffee or something from time to time. But well, you know. look, look, I don't know what he makes, but I would guess he's making something north of a hundred thousand. But I also think he's probably living on about thirty. That's just a guess. And and uh, and so. But in some parts of the world, in some parts of the country, living on thirty thousand is challenging. Well, yes. And the good news is he's not living with his parents. I mean, there are a lot of these young people who are trying to get there by living with their parents. Right. So it's right. Which is bad for us parents. (laughs) Bad for us parents. Bad. Uh, Paul, let's get to the to the gist of all this, though. The Craig Israelson piece about the amount of time, interesting statistics, great facts. What's the ultimate lesson, though, of all this for investors? Well, I think to be realistic, that's what we're looking for. So that when these what appear or feel like strange outcomes happen, that they are not really strange. And since people judge the short term so harshly, by the way, if they do well over a year, they may be committed to something for 20 years. If they just do well the first year, on the other hand, if they do poorly the first year, they're going to go look for some other way to, to solve this problem. And they, well, then the key is to start with a Ponzi scheme the first year <laughs> and then switch them to a real portfolio the next year. Oh, this is your new business plan. I got it. I just figured that one out. <laughs> I got it. I got it. Okay. Tom, what do you no, think? I'm not going with you on the Ponzi scheme thing, but, um, but <laughs> okay. you know, well, you know, 18 percent the first year. There's that. trust nothing in the short term. And, but I think what I what I said and what you all sort of agreed to in of some extent is in the long haul. It is a leap of faith. It is trust in capitalism, if you will, that things do grow. They get bigger companies, get more efficient. And you're simply exposing your money to those things. By the way, when people tell me, well, I don't trust the stock market, I say, you don't trust companies then? I mean, not one at a time, maybe, mm-hmm. but in a whole, I think you probably should because they are making mm-hmm. things, they're doing things, they're productive, they're employing people, they're spinning up pro- all that kind of thing in aggregate has worked for a long period of time. What that means in terms of what your return will be like in the next 10 years or 20 or 30, I really don't know. I hope it's great. I'm going to expand that. I'm going to take that even farther. You shouldn't just trust in capitalism. You should trust in human nature. And we have more than than 100, more than 200, more than 300 years of data to support that. We have literally thousands of years of economic data that support the fact that human beings have built, since we civilized 8,000 years ago, we have built a more and more valuable world, a a greater market capitalization of the planet for as long as we've been around. So if you have faith in us, then you should be an investor. And by the way, my Can wife I, says I've only been civilized for about three of those 8,000 years. So that's a whole well, I didn't say now. us oh, okay. specifically. Uh, and let me add something, two things uh, to that in terms of a lesson to begin with. I think it's a pretty cool lesson to know that you only have to have 60% of your money in equities to make almost as much as you would have made in an all equity portfolio. 
But keep in mind that 1% difference is probably worth somewhere between $1 and $2 million over a lifetime. So it's not peanuts. And the other thing is a follow-up on your comment about the trust and the ability to grow. We have done so well in this country that the average, I just saw this number yesterday, the average value of people's assets of all families is $1.1 million. So it sounds to me like we must be doing great. Or it sounds like capitalism is doing great for a few people, if you look yeah, at I was how just many say, people. No. If you average that out, then, ah. you know, really, I'd be doing a lot better if Bill and uh, Jeff would just uh, <laughs> share the wealth. Well, they're in the process of doing that, I'm sure. But but it, With their ex-wives. <laughs> but you know something? <laughs> I believe that the people who follow the work that we're following, because we are not originators of all this information, we are all of us passing on what we've learned from people that we trust. And I do believe that all of us who will just be able to stay the course with these really time-tested strategies that doesn't guarantee the future, that you're going to do all right, whatever all right is. And I really suggest it will be valuable for you to read that article. All right. All right. I'm with him. All right. Yeah, all right. In case you didn't know. All right, guys. <clears throat> Part what? I said I'm with him You're in with case whom? you didn't know. Paul. I I'm figured going that along out. With him. Hey, this was great. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. It's been a real hey, pleasure. To, uh, let me, yes, by, yes, By the Paul. way, tell us now, these, these are going on YouTube. Correct. And they're going on your channel. They're going on my channel. But Correct. you have other things on your channel that I don't have on my channel. So the people we who do. go to my channel should go. To, I mean, you do some yeah, other we things. Have, on we have, oh, yeah, we yeah, have we have some other things. Yeah. I mean, we've got cats, cat stuff, all kinds of stuff like that. It's good. I, I just want it. people to understand that both of us, uh, both organizations are trying to educate people. And we both have our own styles and different kinds of information. Uh, I hope those yeah. people who are checking us out are checking you out, and I'm hoping people checking you out are checking us out. That's uh, And let me share all of the ways you can check us out in aggregate and individually. One, you can go on to any podcast service, any of the major podcast services, and look up Paul Merriman or Don McDonald or Tom Cock, or our shows are called, Paul's is called Sound Investing. Uh, you put up three episodes a week, is that right? Uh, no, 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 no. One, just one, one plus the one more. we do every two weeks. No, I'm an old oh. guy. I have a okay. hard time getting up in the morning anymore. So, uh, well, <laughs> go for that. Tom walk. and I do try to. Do, Tom and I try to do about five a week. I know, I know. It's and, good stuff. Uh, podcast that's audio, and then videos. Tom and I do some together, and then every two weeks we do this with Paul, which is on the YouTube channel, Talking Real Money. He subscribe. Paul's is at the YouTube channel, Paul Merriman. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> And Great. then if you want to visit either of our websites, Paul's is paulmerriman.com. It's all run together. Mm -hmm. And ours is talkingrealmoney.com. And in both cases, we're here to help make people better. So You're going to get a better education. Let us You're know. You're going to get a better education than you get through 90 plus percent of the resources out there. Because most of them are, to everybody is a little self-serving in this world. But most of the information out there is totally self-serving and not in your best interest. So be very, very wary but, and check out everything. But be careful, Don, because understand that, yes, well, I totally agree that most of the information is self-serving. But isn't that the way that capitalism works? I mean, they are right. in business. Right. What we We're want self-serving, you... too. But... We're self-serving in a way that puts you first and our wants and needs second, yeah. I believe. And bottom line is you do a better job with your investing on your own or with the help of people like Tom and Don. And I think you're going to be way ahead listening to the people who really are not in this to educate. So stick around. We'll be here to help. 
All right. Thank you so much for being a part of our podcast, our video casts, all of our casts. Paul, Tom, and Don will get together again in a couple of weeks. Tom and Don get together all the That's bloody right. time. So, I'm sorry, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's our lot in life. Thank you all. It's what, we, it's what we have to do. Thank you all for watching. Thank you all for listening. Talk to you soon. We hope you realize that the information provided on Talking Real Money is for educational and hopefully enjoyable purposes only. Providing personalized financial planning or investing advice takes time, so please consult with a really good fee-only fiduciary investment, tax, or legal advisor. We know a good one. Investing must always involve risk. In other words, you can and probably will lose money at times. Also, as much as you want it, no one can accurately, consistently predict the future. So past performance doesn't tell you a darn thing about what the future will bring. Unlike many other programs that say something similar, Talking Real Money is not trying to get you to buy or sell any financial products or securities. Instead, the program is provided as a public service by Vestry, a fee-only registered investment advisor. Thanks for listening, and please visit TalkingRealMoney.com for more information and disclosures. That's a wrap.